So you get kind of higher productivity from a wind turbine compared with a, a solar panel. Um, and, and that's even and that's even more productive offshore. And so offshore wind, you have more consistent uh, more consistent wind speeds, stronger winds as well. So that that means kind of if you imagine a wind turbine operating 100% of the time, that's kind of the theoretical maximum. You can get between 40 to 60% of the of that generation typically on a wind project. Now that 60% isn't too far off the kind of percentage we we could see from a, a kind of conventional generator, a gas or a coal plant. Oh, really? What about like nuclear? Isn't nuclear a lot better than that? Nuclear, it's much harder to ramp up and down. And so they True. tend to operate completely as, as base loads. So you get really high what we call capacity factors for nuclear. So it's operating almost all the time if it's if it's part of the mix. So you mentioned, so part of the issue is the, the offtake contract. So basically, if I'm a developer, you know, Paul goes and says, okay, I'm going to buy this win from you for this amount of time. He's going to pay me this, which gives me clarity on then how I can go and invest that money. But my costs go up and I'm kind of left naked at that point. How is that being resolved? You mentioned subsidies, but like what else? Because that gap is very unpredictable. And I remember talking to Siemens um, North America ahead about that. And they're like, we took on all the commodity risk and they're trying to change that now because they're not commodity traders. But like, how do you do that? Well, yeah, it's that, it's that un unpredictability that hit developers especially hard. So um, in, in the previous contracts, those ones I was talking about that got cancelled, mm -hmm. there was very little adjustment in the contract price to account for moving commodity prices, to account for inflation. So that's the kind of thing that states are building into these contracts now to kind of better share the risk between a state, which is buying the power, and the, and the, the de developer that's building the project. So we're seeing uh, kind of these prices getting indexed to uh, CPR, for example, uh, to certain kind of uh, producer oh, price indexes and to certain commodity prices to make sometimes a one-time adjustment from when you agree to that price to when you're actually securing finance. Um, and sometimes it, um, you, you see that adjustments accounting for inflation right throughout the life of the mm. project. That's interesting. That's the kind of structure we see in lots of other countries that have managed to build large-scale offshore wind projects globally. And so, uh, yeah, from the offshore wind industry's perspective, uh, it's good to see that happening in the U.S. as well. Talk to us about, you mentioned the, the, the project off the coast of New York. Talk to us about like, the economics. How much did it cost to build that thing? Who paid for it? And just the economics of so, it. So that um, is a, a project called South Fork. It was the um, kind of the first commercial scale yeah. offshore wind project in the US. That was significantly more expensive than a project we expect to see getting installed today. Um, that's partly because it was it was almost like a proof of concept. So okay. up until then, there were only seven operational offshore wind turbines off the coast of the US so far. So this is the first kind of larger scale project. For one of the newer projects, um, you're probably looking between 2.8 to $3 billion for a one gigawatt project, which is a really big offshore wind farm, um, almost 10 times the size of that early kind of commercial scale project that just mm. came off, off the coast of, of New York. So these are, are really sizable infrastructure investments, yeah. What part is the hardest? Because it seems to me that you know moving the energy from offshore to the grid on land, like you gotta like build a transmission line for that. Like that seems really hard and dangerous. And then I also hear of the transmission plug shortages. So basically the thing you need to actually plug that wind into the grid, there's a shortage of that. And then you gotta build it and there's all the raw material costs that come with actually building the turbine. Where's the biggest um, price increases? Um, well, I mean, we saw a lot of price increases across the board uh, over the last couple of years. Actually, when you look at a lot of commodity prices that are important for, for manufacturing of, of wind turbines, cables, that kind of thing, a lot of those raw material costs have come down. What we've seen is turbine prices have remained stubbornly high. Um, wind turbine makers were hit just as hard by rising costs, rising inflation, uh, and many of them were having to uh, deliver on contracts they'd signed at cheaper rates in this higher priced environment. So that means many of the, the kind of ma major wind turbine makers have suffered a lot over the last couple of years. And so they, they're maintaining higher prices to, to kind of have a bit of a buffer on their margin, trying to, to, to regain kind of stronger margins. Um, but that means that developers are left paying higher prices for the turbines, despite the fact that some of these input costs have started coming down. Who makes these big turbine things out in the ocean? Uh, so that's companies like uh, Vestas, uh, Siemens Energy, uh, GE is a, is a big US player. 
Um, and so those GE are... GE Vernova, I think, GE right? Vernova, yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. There you GE go. Vernova recently <laughs> spun out. Um, uh, Orsted. I mean, do they... Orsted, right? So Orsted's one of the, one of the companies that builds, um, builds the project. So one of the biggest project developers globally. But they'll be the guys putting in the orders with, with your likes of Vestas, GE, oh, Siemens. Gotcha. I uh, mean, how do you build these things? I mean, how do you install them? I mean, Difficultly. It's Difficultly. Tough. Yeah. It's tough. Do I, mean, I build them on land, ship them out there, then just plug them in the sand? I mean, how does this work? So, uh, so most of what's getting built at the moment is, is bottom fixed offshore wind. So you go out there, you build a foundation that's fixed to the seabed, and then you come out and you build the turbine on top of that. So you build up the tower, and then component by component kind of build the big fan oh, you can see at the top right? of the turbines. Imagine. I know. But, and then also, how do you, then the question is like, if something happens and it gets and it's broken. Like, how do you fix it? Like, what's it like when you go offshore? I mean, what happens when one of these things dies? It just like, what's the shelf life of a turbine? And how do you recycle it? I don't. We haven't. We don't know that yet. Yeah. Well. Well. Going to your question on on what happens when it goes wrong or how you construct it, you need really specialized vessels to build these things. So they call them jack up vessels. So they're vessels that kind of have legs that they uh, they extend down into the seabed. Mm -hmm jacks up the vessel so it's sitting kind of above the water so you've got a solid platform by which to install the components or if something goes wrong to to send it out there take off one of the components and and, and replace it with with a fixed one um, but these are really specialized vessels they cost a lot of money to build our, our estimates are around 300 to 500 million dollars oh um, and there's a shortage of these things globally at the moment to, to the kind of specialized vessels to install the foundations and then and then the turbines so if you're a developer you're struggling to find those slots where you mm. can secure vessels Vessels. Um, and if something goes wrong on a recently installed project with one of these big, um, big new turbines, then you might struggle to, to get a vessel to come in and do that, do that replacement work.